The Uncanny Valley is an effect explaining the uneasy feeling we get from seeing images that closely resemble humans but are not quite realistic. From wax figures in museums to humanoid-looking robots, we can typically spot the slightest divergence from normal human faces and movements and feel uncomfortable, wary of them. These faces, however, don't produce quite the same uneasy feeling from us. They may seem stilted, and the details may indicate that this is not actually a photo. But overall, AI has managed to generate very convincing human portraits. Portraits of people that don't exist, but definitely could. Although these are fascinating examples, you may notice that they're randomized. To generate something from a written prompt is an entirely different deal, but modern AI tools like DALL-E, Stable Diffusion, and Midjourney seem to be conquering that challenge as well. How do they do that? The earliest technology to produce realistic images like that has been Generative Adversarial Networks, or GANs. Computer scientist Ian Goodfellow came up with the idea for GANs one night in a bar in 2014. By that time, an AI technique called deep learning was all the rage. Deep learning uses neural networks, similar to those humans have to recognize objects on photos or videos or words in a spoken sentence. Deep learning has shown great results in medicine, identifying diseases on medical images, in finance and e-commerce to uncover fraudulent transactions, in virtual assistants like Siri or Alexa to understand human speech. One of the most prominent deep learning advancements was detecting humans, cars, and road signs in self-driving cars. Basically, back then, the technology was pretty good at describing objects in photos, but not vice versa, creating them from descriptions. At that time, Ian Goodfellow was interning at Google, creating a deep neural network capable of reading address numbers from images from Street View. So, when he entered a popular student bar to celebrate his friend's graduation, he was naturally involved in a tricky computer science topic. I was at a bar with some friends at a going away party, and we were arguing about how to get over this particular barrier. So some of my friends were working on a different algorithm that can learn from unlabeled data, and I was saying that their idea wasn't likely to work, but a, a different version of it that ended up being GANs uh, could actually do what they were hoping to do. His idea was different. What if you pit two neural networks against each other? So I actually went straight home from the bar and coded them up that evening. And it worked. What does it mean to pit two models against each other? Think about how people learn. Imagine you're teaching a child about different animals. You show them a picture of a horse, and they must say what this animal is called. If the child says that it's a dog, we correct them and tell them that it's a horse. Then, the next time a child sees the picture of a horse, they must be able to give a correct answer. In machine learning, this method is called supervised learning. When a machine tries to identify the subject on an image, the training data contains what the expected output should be, and then the model adjusts its behavior to minimize the difference between its guess and the desired output. But when it comes to imagining a new picture, there's no desired output to compare it to. We can only assess if the imagined picture is good or not. So, instead of having a person judging every generated image, we assign this task to another neural network. That's the trick with generative adversarial networks. One network is called a generator, and it tries to generate realistic images. Another model is called a discriminator, and it's fed both generated images and real ones, so it tries to guess which ones are real. At first, both of them are really bad at their job. A generator receives random noise as an input, so it will start by creating something random as well. A discriminator won't know synthetic from real data at first, but by not being able to guess correctly, it will update itself for a new iteration. As the generator learns from its mistakes, it starts producing convincingly good results. And as soon as both discriminator and human are fooled to believe the generated image is real, the learning process is considered a success. This is why they're called generative adversarial networks. By playing against an adversary, a generator learns to make realistic images. Images that don't look like training data, but are rather completely new images that seem to be real. In some way, 
GANs are AI models that have imagination. As we've already seen, GANs are particularly good at generating faces, as well as animals or landscapes. They've also been pretty popular for image editing. For example, aging people up, changing horses to zebras, or transferring a famous painter's art style onto real photos. GANs allowed us to experience the world where computers are capable of making up images. But those images are not actually generated from complex written prompts the way we're used to today. That's because state-of-the-art image generators have an important component for understanding human text. How does it work? You've probably already had a few conversations with AI. Siri, Google, or Amazon Alexa have been with us for a while, and apart from some unfortunate fails, they've become very good at giving us what we want. The branch of AI tasked to teach machines to understand human speech is called Natural Language Processing, or NLP. And for such complex tasks as image generation, we need a model that correctly interprets all nuances of speech. It's one thing to create an image of a duck. But what if you want a duck with green rain boots and an umbrella? The machine must understand that boots are apparel, and the duck must be wearing them, and an umbrella is something you hold above your head. So the task is not just translating human words into machine language, but populating each word with context characteristics that indicate how the thing that this word describes should be portrayed. One of the earliest ideas for generating images from a written description was to use captions. If deep learning models are so good at describing what they see on the image, maybe we could reverse the process too. Most images on the internet are accompanied by textual descriptions, so it only makes sense to train AI not only with images, but also with their corresponding captions. Being trained on the pairs of images plus descriptions, the model learns to extract important features and their relationships with one another. Of course, this is done using numbers, and not just numbers, but vectors. They are coordinates of particular concepts in the multidimensional space. The duck, for example, can have a myriad of characteristics or dimensions. It's a living being, a bird. It's typically small. It can walk and swim and fly. Each of these characteristics is a separate dimension, and the word duck is placed somewhere in the space. Now, the word duckling is very similar in meaning and shares most of the same characteristics, so it would be placed very close to the word duck in the same space. Other animals might be close too, while humans can be a bit farther, and words for different objects or even concepts even farther from them all. There are thousands of images of ducks the model is trained with, and they're all pretty different representations of the same thing. To simplify matters and make similar objects closer to each other, we reduce the dimensions and place data into a latent space, a compressed and more abstract representation of the original multidimensional space. This way, thousands of ducks with their own set of characteristics become one idea of a duck that shares them all. This way, when tasked to generate a duck, a model doesn't copy any particular image from the dataset, but crafts a completely new one from the combinations of the characteristics that it captured. Now, as we understand how computers apply context to the words they receive as prompts, let's talk about the state-of-the-art technology that overthrew GANs and powers modern AI generation tools. Meet Diffusion Models just a year after Goodfellow came up with the idea of GANs, a physicist, Yasha Sol Dickstein, invented diffusion models. By that time, he already spent a few years helping NASA send rovers to Mars and came to Stanford to research non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Computer science was actually his side interest, but he managed to make a breakthrough thanks to his physics background. So what are diffusion models, and what are their connections to physics? You know how when you spray some perfume in a room, and the fragrance is really strong in one part of the room, but then it gets dispersed, leaving only a trace behind? In physics, this principle is called diffusion, and non-equilibrium thermodynamics actually describes the probability of finding a molecule of perfume in the room at each step of the diffusion process. Inspired by this concept, Sol Dickstein applied it to generative modeling. What if images were turned into noise just like perfume disperses in a room, and then the machine learned to reverse the process and turn the noise back into images? Here's how it works. 
First, a diffusion model takes a training image and starts adding noise to it. With each step, the image loses its details until it becomes only noise. The idea is that the model learns what the image looks like at each stage so it can then reconstruct it. During the reversal process, the model tries to predict what the next, less noisy image will look like. At first, the results will look far from the original image, but you tweak the parameters so with each iteration the model does better, until it finally shapes into a new image. Diffusion models quickly took the machine learning world by storm. By having multiple steps in the denoising process, they can create extremely detailed images, and the technology has been advancing at immense speed. Diffusion models are used not only to create new images, but also to add generated objects to existing photos or extend them in just a few clicks. And although they can deliver nonsense results, in many cases, with the right prompts used, the outcome is mind-blowing. So let's talk about the tools that are powered by this technology. These are the images generated by the first version of DALL-E in 2021, before it used diffusion models. And this is the image created by the same prompt today by the most recent version, DALL-E 3. The level of detail, the realism, and the consistency of art style is striking. Today, DALL-E by OpenAI, the same people behind ChatGPT, is one of the most advanced image generation models. One of the ways they manage to improve the model is by improving the dataset with AI. Typically, AI models are trained using pairs of images and corresponding captions from the internet. Of course, quite often, those captions are not as detailed or even remotely helpful. So for DALL-E 3, OpenAI used captions generated by a language model that can produce accurate descriptions on a whim. For instance, we've asked DALL-E 3 to create an image of a cat wearing sunglasses on a spacecraft, and the model expanded the prompt, describing the sleek and metallic interior of the spacecraft, the cat's fluffy coat and an air of confidence, and the background with stars and distant planets. Another popular AI tool is Midjourney which entered open beta in 2022. It's become one of the most well-known tools thanks to the controversy when an image created using Midjourney won a fine art competition. Allegedly, it also uses diffusion to generate images. And although we don't know exactly how it works, we can assume that thanks to the way users interact with generated images, the model receives a lot of feedback on which images perform best and apply it to improve. Another popular tool is Stable Diffusion by Stability AI. Released in 2022, it actually introduced the idea of latent diffusion models, which we talked about before. Thanks to that, image generation now happens much faster. It's also the only big tool that's open source and you can run on your own computer. It has several built-in tools and you can download custom models and have more control over your images. Despite the fact that all three tools use the same diffusion technology, they all produce different results due to different datasets and embedding processes. Some experienced users can even guess what tool was used for what image. Let's check to see if you can guess which two. Which of these images do you think was generated by which tool? Press pause if you need more time. Now, this knight was created by Midjourney. This faceless hero by Stable Diffusion, and the final night belongs to Dolly. E. Did you get any of them right? AI still has a lot to learn before it can produce truly errorless pictures. Also, many generated pictures today have the specific AI look that makes them easy to pinpoint if you've seen enough of them. But the generic AI style and misunderstandings can be overcome with the right prompts. An AI prompt engineer is a specialist that understands how NLP works and uses a variety of techniques to get the most value from generated results. These capabilities introduced us to the concept of AI-assisted art, where users can get unique results by crafting complex prompts. Of course, there's more to say on the topic of ethics and value of such art, which we plan to explore in one of our future videos. It's clear that we've accepted AI-generated images in our work and personal lives. We use it for inspiration and brainstorming, for sharing ideas, for enhancing images and videos, and just for fun. 
You can see our video on generative AI in business for more ideas on using it. Just like any breakthrough technology, it poses a lot of questions that we are yet to answer and will require a lot of understanding and skills from us to benefit from it. But this is only a matter of time. Join us as we explore the many sides of AI-generated content and let us know in the comments what you'd like us to cover next. And of course, don't forget to subscribe and leave a like if you've enjoyed this video. We'll see you soon.